knuckle sandwich. Times are hard, and pastors are getting angry and damble. Whether you believe the way I believe or not, I don't care. Videotape me. I run the devil out of our church, so get out. Don't come on this property again. Understand me. All right, well, as I, All leave, right. as I leave, I hope you read 2 Timothy 2.24. I hope you read too, son. You worry about your own problems. You get out of my business. There is no better business bureau in religion. The Church of Christ, then, is your best bet. We're at the tent, 7 p.m. each night, June 22nd through July the 3rd, across from the mall in Danville on Mount Cross, right next to Leggett's Town and Country. Everybody in town will be talking. You worry about your own problems. You get out of my business. Well, hello, my name is Stacy King. Those of you in the North Carolina and Danville area know me from singing. I turned on my TV to the Star News Channel. I don't know what channel it is for you, but find Star News and watch it every night until this just gentleman is going to come on the TV and he's going to ask you what does the Bible say. Watch his broadcast. After you watch it, come to Danville like you're going to the Walmart. Everybody know how to get to Walmart. And you're going to see a tent. They're having a tent revival that ends on July the 3rd. Come and please hear this man tell you what the Bible says. All right. Welcome, everybody, to uh, What Does the Bible Say? A Word from the Lord, brought to you by the Church of Christ. We're meeting at the tent. We hope that you'll come and, and uh, visit with us. Started June 22nd. We're out here on... Uh, on uh, Leggett Town and Country parking lot, CarQuest Auto Park, 33 Mount Cross Road. Hope you'll come out to the tent. A lot going on in the tent. <clears throat> a lot of visitors, a lot of people coming out examining the truth. Maybe some people have heard us from the, for the first time. We've knocked on a lot of doors, uh, and we hope that you'll be one of those individuals that come through our doors. Come on out. You might meet your friend. You might see people that you didn't know were there, but we uh, uh, want you to come out and be invited. We don't mind you bringing your children some people use children as an excuse we don't mind little children members of the church have children that we bring them to the tent because we want to impress upon them at a young age the need to get out with the gospel of christ as a matter of fact our youngsters go out we've been door knocking this past uh, a week the past what are we on this is to be the seventh day won't it <clears throat> started on started on saturday and now this is Friday, so this is seven days we've been knocking doors, Danville. And I want to tell you, uh, folks, that if you uh, haven't had your door knocked on yet by someone from the Church of Christ, more than likely you're going to because we have been out in force uh, knocking on doors. As a matter of fact, today we have knocked on or passed out 7,370 flyers. And, you know, we have been... Uh, uh, accused of not caring about the loss. I think it was uh, uh, Dwayne King Snake, King Cobra over here at uh, uh, Piedmont Baptist that said we didn't care about the loss, we don't love the loss. And I submit to you that we've probably knocked more doors this past week than he's knocked in his lifetime. Um, we have uh, been diligent about going out. If you go out to the tent, there'll be a map set right there on the table. When you first walk in, you can see where we've been. We're highlighting all the roads. We've been knocking on doors. It is just uh, uh, amazing at the amount of uh, ground we have covered. And with just a few folks, you know, a lot of people, sometimes people accuse us or they uh, scoff at the fact that we have a small number. You know, I people say, well, you got your 70, your 60, your 50, whatever over there. Let me tell you something, friends. We have been out knocking doors with anywhere from 15 to 20 individuals. I think one day we actually had 34 come out. But we've been knocking doors with anywhere, usually less than 20 people, and we have covered that much ground with that small of a force. And it all, begin, it all gets down to our determination. Paul said, we believe, therefore we speak. And uh, if you don't think that we're determined to get, get the gospel that we preach out, then uh, uh, just think again, please, because we're determined that you're going to hear the gospel, and that's why we're bringing you... Uh, so much airtime bringing you this program on, on television because we love what, what, what the Lord says and we know that it is what's going to save your soul and so we hope that you will at least examine us. I mean, even the, uh, even the atheists and the agnostics, the agnostics are saying last night, uh, Mr. Larry Serber called in and said he's watching, you know, so uh, if nothing else, we are getting people to open their Bible or at least listen 
to what God has to say, and that is, that is really our goal. That's really all we can do. Paul said that uh, we just had to plant. Someone else can water. God's going to give the increase, but it's our determination to go out and preach the gospel. So we hope you'll come out to the tent and be with us. Here is, here is what we want you to do. Not only do we want you to come to the tent, now if you, if, if you will just come to the tent, that's fine, but if you want the icing on the cake, you know, if you want the gravy on the biscuit, then bring your pastor, bring your preacher, your bishop, your rabbi, your, your, your elder or whatever he may be, bring him out to the tent and tell him you want him to give an answer for why you believe what you believe. Now, chances are he's going to say no. But you know, I have a lot of people say, well, I'm going to ask my pastor. I'm going to give this flyer to my pastor. And uh, I'm, going, I'm going to say, I'm going to go on record, I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I'll say that they're not, going to, they're not going to come. You can ask them. They're not going to come because they're this, they're chicken. We're saying don't be a chicken, you know. Don't be a chicken. Come to the tent. Bring your pastor. These men are, are afraid. These men are afraid to, to come out and give an answer. They've been on TV, but this man left town, don't know where he is. This man said he'd come on TV, J.C. Richardson. He's a liar. He comes on TV and says he's going to uh, uh, have a debate, and then he takes all the time against the contract, broke, broke his own word. That's the kind of men that, that you're dealing with. Those are the kind of men that are your pastors and your bishops and your so-called religious leaders. But we're saying in, in tell them you are tired, if you're tired, one of these individuals that are tired of hearing us talk all the time and want to hear, see our mouth stopped. You know, the Bible says to, to, to unstop the mouths of the unruly. Well, if you, we are so bad, why don't you stop us? Go ahead and stop us. And here's what's in it for you, friends. If you will bring one of these guys out, one of your pastors out, tell us who he is, uh, announce himself, tell us who he is, uh, wh where, he, where he's preaching, what, what church he's of, and then ask a question or give an answer, then this is what you will get. Now, I've been saying $25, but it's actually up to $50, a $50 gas card, to anyone who will bring their pastor, preacher, elder, bishop, rabbi out and answer the question about why you believe what you believe. This is what's in it for you. Now, friends, you, you just can't get a better offer than that. Not only is the gospel free, gas is free to you. If you'll bring your pastor out now, like I said, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet. I don't think we're going to give this $50 gas away. We're going to have to figure out what we're going to do with it. Some of our brethren, when they decided this is what they were going to do, one of our brothers popped up and said, well, what are you really going to do with it? You know, you can make the offer that we're going to give this to the person that brings their pastor, but what are you really going to do with it because the pastor won't come? You still got to figure out what you're going to do with that $50 gas card. Well, we'll, we'll figure something out, but I will say this. I will say this, friends, if you will come and bring your pastor, that $50 gas card is in the tent right now. And, I, and I, I'm probably, uh, if I'm figuring out our time right, more than likely it's being offered right now or about this time. So come on out to the tent. Come on out to the tent. 335 Mount Cross Road, Leggett Town and Country, parking lot, right beside Carquest Auto Parts, a car off from the mall. Come on out to the tent. Bring your questions, bring your Bible questions after the service, after the closing prayer. Microphone will be extended to you. If you have a question, you can ask it. All the DVDs, all the literature is free of charge if you will just come on out. So come on out and be a part of this great effort. Uh, I'm not sure what our visitor count is up to date, but, but I know I've, we've seen, I, I'm going to say, five, at least five visitors every night from the community. And Monday night we had a great number of visitors. So uh, come on out. Come on out to the tent. Now, Last night, we got started with our myth busting, and we didn't really get through the first myth. But I want you to know, friends, that this is exactly what we've been doing, not just under the tent, but every time we get up and we step into the pulpit, or when we have a Bible class, or when we come on television, we are all about busting myths. And the way you bust a myth is by you give the word. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 24. We are all about giving the Word of God out because the Word of God is the truth that actually can withstand the scrutiny, the test of time, and actually condemn and, and, and bring to naught the doctrines of men. So we're all about busting myths. And last night we began showing you a clip from a woman that came to the tent 
the so-called prophetess. Now, I'm not going to play the whole clip again last night. We didn't even get through it all, all night. Just a 10-minute clip. But people started calling in. But I want you to consider about this prophetess. Now, I might play, I'm going to bring it up just so I can play some of it perhaps. But I don't want to, I don't want to go through the whole thing again. But we might have an opportunity to uh, uh, tell you about some things that she says and just remind you of, of some things that she did say. But on Monday, the day we put the tent up, the woman came up to the tent. She announced herself as a prophetess and an apostle. And she came to the tent, and she was, you know, basically saying she came to find out what we were all about. Now, friends, one thing that you can always do if you are a, a, a student of God's Word is you know that a prophet can be tested. A prophet can be examined to find out if, in fact, they are speaking the truth. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy 18, verse 22, one of the things that, that the Bible tells us is that you can test a prophet. If the things come to pass, you know that they are a prophet. You know that they're speaking from God. And if not, you know that they are speaking presumptuously. Now, we suspected right off the bat that this woman was speaking presumptuously. She wasn't who she claimed to be. She, she uh, uh, didn't show any kind of demonstration that she was a, a prophet. But up, up until this time... You know, we have yet to see if she is indeed a prophet. But this is what we did. We're going to test her tonight. We've been testing her. We've been waiting to see if her words came to pass. But notice this. In Deuteronomy 18, 22, here's what it says. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not and are come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him, or in this case, afraid of her. Well... That is what we did. The prophet has said, and I'm trying to get my, my uh, uh, listing out here so I can find out where she actually said it. But the prophet has said that I was going to apologize to her because of the way that I treated her or the way I mistreated her, according to her. That's her words. But I'm going to submit to you that uh, we're just going to see if her words come to pass. Now, notice this. Uh, in about, let's just see here. Get over here to it. We're going to skip on down to about chap, uh, about uh, eight minute, minute eight. Let's see what she says here. I'm not asking no more. I'm saying if you demonstrate your apostle, I will not only apologize to you, but I guarantee you everybody here will be in your church the next one. That's right. But they go, you're going to apologize in front of all these people up in here. If I, if I have to, if you and you're to apologize to God. Now, is that the prophecy that we're waiting to see fulfilled? That I'm going to eat my words and I'm going to apologize to her? Now, I told you, friends, why I would apologize to her or when I would apologize to her. When she came to the tent, she said she's coming back. Haven't seen her in, any this week so far. We've been there Monday night. We've been there Tuesday night. We've been there Wednesday night. We were there last night. We were there tonight. That's five nights. Haven't seen her back to the tent. She said she's coming. She's got... Saturday night, she's got Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. She's got six more nights to come out and fulfill this prophecy. And the way she's going to do it is she's going to demonstrate that she is an apostle or that she is a prophet. Uh, if she'll demonstrate she's an apostle, then I'll believe she's a prophet as well. And when she does, then I will gladly eat my words and I will gladly apologize to her. And I'll be in her church the very next morning. Now, we're waiting to see this prophecy fulfilled. She's got six days for it to be fulfilled. You know, a prophecy requires a, 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 a amount of time set forth so it can come to pass. Now, she said something bad is going to happen to me and, and, and I guess cursed me, I guess you might say. But one thing she did say is that I was going to apologize to her. I was going to apologize to her and I was going to eat my words. Well, I'm not eating my words. You know, I could die tonight and I'm not eating my words. Because she's not a prophetess. She is not an apostle. 
Now, this is what we're about. We're trying to bust these myths. You see, friends, when people come and, and say the Lord did something through them or that they are something... There are ways to find out if they are indeed are speaking the truth. Now, a real prophet or a real prophetess would have known what was going to happen when she came to the tent. You see, but this woman, uh, th this woman says that uh, 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 this woman says that she came to find out what the what the tent was all about. Listen to what she says here. All right, she came over here to see what kind of service we're going to have, and I attacked her. Well, she should have known if she was a prophetess, she should have known she's going to be attacked. She should have known that she was going to be questioned when she came up telling us that she was a prophetess or when she said that she was an apostle. She should have known that's what we were going to do. Even, I mean, even someone who has only watched this, has never has, uh, seen this program one time, knows that we're going to question anything that is contrary to this Bible. Now, a prophet would know that. A prophetess would know that what we're going to do is, is try the spirits. Look, a prophet knows things beforehand. Consider, if you would, 1 Kings chapter 14. 1 Kings chapter 14. And notice this. Now, David was, uh, now King David was old and stricken with years. No, this is not what I want. Uh, it is 2 Kings 14, my bad. 2 Kings 14, not looking for David. We're looking for... Um, and that's still not it. Maybe it is... I'm looking for that. Um, I see a real prophet who had the Holy Spirit of God... Wouldn't, wouldn't have this trouble that I'm having here. Individuals who claim to have direct uh, knowledge from God, miraculous Holy Spirit uh, help, they don't have the same problem that I'm having. But I know it's chapter 14. 1 Kings 14. What did I type in? 1 Kings 14. There it is. I must have typed in 1 Kings 4. All right. I had it right the first time. See? All you folks that say uh, that I'm wrong all the time, no, the only time I was wrong was when I was, thought I was wrong when I wasn't. <clears throat> now, at that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. We're going to show that a prophet knows things beforehand. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise, I pray thee, disguise thyself, and thou sh uh, and that thou be not known to the wife of Jeroboam, uh, to the wi uh, be known to be the wife of Jeroboam, and get thee to Shiloh. Behold, there is a hide to the prophet which told me that I should be king over his people. And take with thee ten loaves <clears throat> and cracknels and a cruise of honey and go to him, and he shall tell thee what shall become of the child. And Jeroboam's wife did so and arose, went to Shiloh, and came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were set by reason of his age. And the Lord said unto Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask a thing of thee for her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus shalt thou say unto her, for it shall be when he, when she cometh in that she shall feign herself to be another woman. And it was so when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet as she came at the door that he said, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam. Why feignest thou thyself to be another? For I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. Now he knew who she was when he heard her feet at the door. Now I submit to you, friends, that if this woman was a prophetess, she would have known the minute she got out of the car when she turned into the parking lot. She know, oh, I'm going to be attacked here. I'm going to be scrutinized. I'm going to be questioned. I'm going to be examined when I tell them I'm a prophet of God. She would have known that. And she would have known what we were going to be doing under the tent. That right there tells you right there she's not a prophetess. She doesn't know things. See, Michael Penn has the, uh, Michael Penn up there in Martinsville, he has the, what is the, the mantle of the prophetic mantle or, or prophecy. You know, these guys that claim to be prophets, 
they would know that when we come into their uh, into their assembly or when we come in, into them that, to question them that it's going to be just that, that we're going to start scrutinizing and trying the spirits to see whether they're really of God. A prophet would know that. See? I mean, but you don't have to have a... And then someone says, well, I knew you was coming. Well, you know what? You can say you knew what we were going to ask or the kind of questions we were going to ask you when we come up to you because we're telling you. We're going to come and examine you and see whether you claim to do what you do. Now, look at this. In 1 Samuel 9, 15, now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cries come unto me. And when Samuel saw... The Lord, and when Samuel saw Saul, there's a tongue twister, the Lord said unto him, Behold, the man whom I spake of thee, spake to thee of, this shall, uh, the same shall reign over my people. God tells his prophets things beforehand that will help them out. Why didn't this woman know things beforehand? I'll tell you why. She wasn't a prophet. She wasn't a prophetess. She said she's coming back. I, who am not a prophet, say she won't come back. And if she does come back, she won't demonstrate. She won't demonstrate that she's a prophet, nor an apostle. And the words that she spake, that said, "I will eat my words and I will apologize to her," they'll fall to the ground. You see, that's exactly what happens to individuals who don't speak uh, for God. In First Samuel chapter three. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, and, and the child Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass that time when Eli laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could see. God spoke to Samuel. Now watch this. When Samuel, uh, when Samuel is called by the Lord or, sp or spoken to by the Lord, notice what happens. This is what happens to, uh, uh, to Samuel. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. And in that day shall I perform against Eli all things that I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will make an end. For, the, for I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. Now, come on down. Here's what, here's what happens to Eli. The, the words of Eli, I mean, excuse me, the word of Samuel, Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground. A prophet who has God's backing does not have to worry about what they say coming to pass. They're going to happen. They're going to come to pass. This woman said I was going to eat my words and I was going to apologize to her in a pig's eye. I'm not going to apologize to her for lying on God. I'm not going to apologize to her for speaking presumptuously. I'm not going to apologize to her for misleading the people. I'm not going to apologize to her for trying to uh, put off as someone great when she's not. She's the one who needs to apologize. She needs to repent. See? And that's what we're talking about, friends. We're busting the myth. See? A real prophet or prophetess would have demonstrated that they were from God. Now, someone says, well, you know, sometimes the Lord hid things from their from the prophets. Okay, we'll give you that one. Let's say the Lord hid from her what was going to happen to her. The Lord, let's say the Lord hid from her eyes the things that were going to happen to her under the tent when she came and, and, was, and was questioned. But you know what? Here's what happens to individuals who speak from God. They are then given by God the power to demonstrate that they are from God. In John chapter 3 and verse 1, Nicodemus said to Jesus, there's a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews, that came to Jesus by night, the same came to Jesus by night, and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. The whole purpose of miracles, and that's what we discussed all night long last night it seemed like, was the fact that miracles were designed to prove that the man speaking was speaking for God. 
Because anybody can say anything, friends. Anybody can come up and say they're a prophet. Anybody can come up and say they're an apostle. Anybody can come up and say that they are supposed from God. But the way you prove that is you demonstrate it. You do something that no one could do except God be with them. You see? Because in the days when the miracles were, were in existence, when miracles were needed, wasn't a day when you couldn't verify what God said because you didn't have his word. You didn't have it written down. And I look at this. In John 2, in verse 22, now I know some of you don't like that. Some of you uh, are wrapped up in this mystical, wonderful, lovey-dovey, mushy-gushy, fuzzy feeling, and you got to have something uh, mystical happen to you or feeling happen to you to make you think that God's with you. You know what? All I need to know that God's with me is, is the fact that he's, he says in his word. I don't need a warm, fuzzy feeling. I just need some, I just need some verification. This is what he said. But look what, look what happens. In Acts 2, verse 22, look what Peter said. He said, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you. How do you know if God approves of a person? How do you know if God has put his stamp of approval upon a person? Approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. Now listen, all these people, well, God works on his own time. Well, you know what? God never let his servants, the prophets, hang. He never left them hanging out to dry. He never left them over there standing in the corner, people saying, you're not really a spokesman from God. Let me tell you, individuals who spoke against God's man, or in this case, God's woman, they were soon convinced that this is indeed a man of God. You didn't just badmouth a man of God and get away with it. You, you, you realized pretty quick, hey, this man is really speaking for God. Look at this. In 2 Kings chapter 1, uh, 2 Kings, uh, first King, uh, yes, yeah, 2 Kings chapter 1. Notice this. Uh, Ahaz, uh, Ahaziah fell down through the lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go, inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover this disease. But the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers from the king of, of Samaria, and say unto them, is it not because there's a God in Israel that you go to inquire of Baal's above the God of Ekron? I mean, are you going all the way down here to the Philistines because there's not a God in, in Israel? That's what they're saying. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed which thou art gone upon, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, Why are ye not turned back? They said unto him, There came a man up to meet us, and said unto us, Go, turn again unto the king that sent you, and say to him, Thus said the Lord, Is it not uh, because there is a, not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore thou shalt not come down from the bed that, on which thou art gone up, but thou shalt surely die. And he said unto them, What manner of man was he that came up to you? All right, and they said, he was a hairy man, girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. Then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty. And he went up to him and said, And behold, he sat on top of a hill and he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of the fifty, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee with thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed he and his fifty. Well, the king sent another captain and another 50 men up to him and says, Come down quickly. And Elijah said, If I be a man of God, let fire from heaven come down and consume thee in thy 50. Fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him in his 50. You know what? These prophets today, they say, Well, it'll only happen if God wants it to happen. Elijah says, Let fire come down from heaven and consume you. He didn't say, well, you know what? If God really wants to destroy you with fire, he will. And you have to wait in his own good time. That's not, what a, that's not what a real prophet says. A real prophet said, let fire from God come down from heaven and it consume him. Now, I want you to know, friends, if this woman was a real prophetess and, give, and we were giving her all the grief, 
Don't you think that tent would be consumed with fire? Can't you just imagine a prophet is coming along and saying, you're denying that I am a spokesman from God? Let fire from heaven come down and consume you and all these people here. Because we were all given a grief. We were all questioning her. You see, that's what a real prophet does. That's what a real prophet does. Now, the last guy that comes up says, look, he says, oh, man of God, he's convinced you're the man of God. He says, oh, man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these 50 servants be pressed in thy sight. You know, don't, don't burn us up. Well, he was spared. This woman didn't demonstrate anything. She didn't give her seal of approval. She didn't give her stamp of authenticity that she was a prophetess or an apostle, not one whit. Not one whit. I say she's not a prophetess. I say she's not a prophetess. Now, she said, she said to me that I was uh, speaking against the, the Lord's anointed, you know, that I was, that I was uh, 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 judging her, which I thought, thought was very interesting that she accused me of judging. She's the one standing over me pointing her finger and getting all up in my face and getting all uppity. I didn't raise her up, she said. Well, she's the one getting aggravated. You know what happens if you speak against the Lord's anointing? Something bad happens to you. Now, if I was mistreating the Lord's anointed and this so-called prophetess, uh, uh, apostleless, I guess, is that a female apostle? Uh, uh, look, look what would happen. In 1 Samuel 26 and verse 11, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, 26, in verse uh, 11, is that what I had up there? Sure did, 1 Samuel 26, 11. David said, The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed, but I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is at his bolster and the cruise of water, and let us go. David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster, and they gathered them away, and no man saw it nor knew it, neither wakened, for they were all asleep because the deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. David did not kill Saul, the man that was trying to kill him, because he recognized that God had anointed Saul king over Israel, even though Saul was a, was a no good, rotten king. Even though he was no good. He said, I'm not going to kill the Lord's anointed. But look what happens. Look what happens. When Saul dies in 2 Samuel chapter 1, uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 1, look what happens. Here was... A, here was a, uh, an occasion where a man comes and he tells David. He says, uh, It came to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. And so it was when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. And David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee tell me. And he answered that the people were fled from battle, and many of the people also are fallen and dead, and Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. And David said to the young man, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan, his son, be dead? And the young man told, that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called to me and said, And I answered and said, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And he answered, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish has come upon me, for, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. Uh, and I took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm, and have brought them hither unto my Lord. And David took hold on his clothes and rent them, and likewise all the men that were with him, and they mourned and wept. And because they were fallen by the sword, and notice this, verse 13, And David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he said, I am a son, I'm a son of a stranger. And Amalekai, David said unto them, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointing? And David called one of the young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. And David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth hath testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. Now, you know what? If I have brought reproach upon the Lord's anointed. I know what happens to individuals who touch the Lord's anointed. I know what happens to people who mistreat God's special servants. I know what happens to individuals that speak against God and defame and, and defame uh, 
uh, his, his servants. But you know what? I'm not afraid of this woman. I'm not afraid of her one bit. I'm not afraid of anything she can do. I'm not afraid of anything she can say because I know she is powerless. She doesn't have any uh, 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 power whatsoever to oppose me or convince me that she is a prophet or an apostle. Now see how easy that, is, that myth is to bust? See how easy that is? I'll tell you what, Brandon, let's, uh, uh, Matt, we can have the phone lines up if, if you want. You see how easy this is? This woman claims to be a prophetess. It's not, not, not so. It's not, it's not such uh, at all. She's not a prophetess. As a matter of fact, she claimed to be an apostle. Look what Jesus commended. Jesus actually commended individuals for judging. Oh, can you imagine that? Judging individuals? In Revelation chapter 2, look at this. And to the angel of the church at Ephesus, write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. They tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. You know what we did, folks? We found out that this woman was a bald-faced liar. She's a liar. Claiming to be an apostle. Claiming to be a prophetess. Please. She's no more a prophetess than a man in the moon. And you know what? All, there's, there's people all over that make the same claim. Chief apostle Lawrence G. Campbell. You know? Apostle this, apostle that. Holy right reverend such and such. They no, they no more have any sort of uh, 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 Seal of approval from God. See, this is what we're saying, friends. You need to, you need to open your eyes. We're trying, to, we're trying to help you see the truth to come out from all these myths. Now, here's our question to it. Where are the signs? Where are the signs? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and verse 12, look at this. Whoop. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. Truly the signs of an apostle are wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Now, you see how easy it is, friends? Just simply ask for a sign. Ask for a deed. Ask for something of amazement. Let's prove that these folks are from God. Let's prove that these folks are indeed who they say they are. Let's see the credentials. You know? You think if someone came knocking on your door and said that we're the police and they were dressed in just plain clothes, are you going to just let them in and take their word for it or are you going to say, let me ask some credentials? Let me see some identification. You know? You get, we get tested for identification more at Walmart. You go to buy something than you, than you, than you would give an, a, a prophetess or an apostle. Somebody comes and says, well, I'm a prophet, I'm an apostle. Oh, isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? You know? You go down here to the store, try to cash a check, and they say, well, I need three forms of ID and a pint of blood. And you say, oh, okay, yeah, I can see that. Because, you know, people are out there trying to defraud everybody and try to cheat everybody. But here comes a, here comes a woman up and says, oh, I'm a prophetess. I'm an apostle. Or here comes some guy up and says, yeah, I'm a chief apostle. Here comes some guy and says, well, I'm a, I'm a holy right reverend with, a, uh, with an anointing from the Lord. And he said, oh, isn't that wonderful? Yeah, you got a word from the Lord. Yeah, let's just hear it. Now, here's my question, friends. Why would you believe these guys who are saying all the good things about you, but then when they turn around and say something bad about you, you say, well, no, that, that guy can't be from God. You see? I know you heard the woman that, that called in and was talking about uh, Roy Dalton, listen, if these guys, if you believe in what these guys say when they say good things, why don't you believe what they say when they say bad things? You see how easy this proof, friends? We're trying to get you to open your eyes. We're trying to get you to see that these folks, they'll lie about God. Look, you know if they'll lie about their credentials, if they lie about their credentials from God, you know they're going to lie about their credentials from men. 
You know, we've been we've been showing uh, on 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 these various programs these guys that go around and promote themselves as something great, when in reality, you know, when in reality they're they're not uh, uh, anything at all. Here is um, uh, J. C. Richardson but, talking uh, about his his degree and his uh, Mr. his Edmund pedigree, you might say. Yourself arrange for a teacher to give you some type of just some type of competency test. It seems like. And just for her to sign off on it in order for you to receive your degree as a uh, doctor. I have no idea what you. Uh, first of all, I'm not familiar with the National Review. Uh, it's Religious Review. Religious Review. Uh, okay. We're a multimedia reviewer of local worship. Uh, it's online at Religious Review Media. If you uh, like to check it out. And well, uh, <coughs> could you state where where you did get your doctorate? At? Uh. uh what I would appreciate is you call them in. Now, let me just say this at this point. You know, someone asks you about where you get your doctrine, where you get your degrees from, and so forth like that. Wouldn't you be more than happy to tell them? Wouldn't you be more than happy to say, well, I got this. Now, he finally got around to say. But, you see, friends, I know that you can see through all this. I know that you can see through all of this, uh, this smoke and mirrors. Look, here's what... Here's what a lady said about uh, uh, these guys when she comes up. Now, now this, is, this, is, this is the lady you saw on the commercial early on. And this is what she says about these guys and how easy it is for people to see through. Listen to what she says. That's nice. Very nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you, too. He's just so brave. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, in this area of the apostle, whoever he is, he's got so many people just so about just being in that cathedral, being in the place, making them think they're important. But then, if he's afraid to even just show, you know, it, it's not hard to say, here's my degree. Mm -hmm. And that's all he went to that's say, right. well, where did you get your credentials from? And when, he, they wouldn't even let, the man would not even show his credentials. And then, then his members come and say, you, you talking bad against him. You, trying, you, you ain't being right, you judging him. No, he's not. He's just wanting you, if you are who you say you are. See, I know I'm Stacey King. Can't nobody tell me who I am. You see what I'm saying? Now, if they call me somebody else, then I can't answer. But I know who I am. And if someone asks me, are you a born-again Christian? Yes, sir. All right, now, I just want to hear what said about these guys. You know, how hard is it to so agree? You, try, you, you ain't being right. You judging him. No, he's not. He's just wanting you. If you are who you say you are. See, I know I'm Stacey King. All right, well, Mr. Right there. But now, see, these people can see it. Now, friends, why is it that you won't question? Why is it you won't question people when they say who they claim to be? See, why is it that you don't question people when they say, "Well, this is who I am," or whatever? Man, I'd be questioning. I'd be scrutinizing. Someone comes to me and says, "Well, I'm so and so. You know, and I'm here. I'm here to uh, do an examination of your house, or I'm here to audit your your books." You know, you'd be asking for some information. Wait a minute, who are you, and who are you with? Uh, I found it interesting that when uh, Mr. Richardson was being questioned, you know, he was he was all about questioning. Now, who are you? The, the Religious Review? Never heard of the Religious Review? Don't know who you are? He was questioning. He was questioning who these guys were. They were asking the questions. But when it comes down to asking questions back, oh, no, we can't do that. We can't have any of that going on. Now, my question is, why not? Why don't you, why don't you allow yourself to be questioned? Why is it that you, or why is it, better yet, why do you hate for people to be questioning? Why do you not like for people to be questioning? See, this is what we always get right here. This is what we always get. Judge not that you be not judged. Boy, that sure is nice. That's a handy, that's a handy little weapon to have. We don't like anybody questioning. Why not? Why don't you like people questioning? You do it all the time. Y'all question us all the time, and that's fine. We're all, we have no problem with it. But what we're saying is, why don't you question other people, the people that are actually teaching you and leading you and convincing you that they are, they are someone they're not. I want to play you something that uh, we, uh, uh, I see a, a clip that we got from a gentleman at Bennett Memorial Missionary Baptist. And I want you to listen to what he okay, says about questioning. Now, we, uh, we, we met this man while knocking doors. We met this gentleman while knocking doors. 
And a question was asked of him. And I want you to notice uh, his response, his response when we were uh, asking him a question. I'm going to try to find the, the, um, uh, his response right here, right quick. Just standing right here with open arms. Welcome to the program. Hey, James. Hey. I just had a question. Okay. I was wondering what happened to people that are taught wrong and don't know that they've been taught wrong and maybe pass away. What happens to them? They wind up in the hands of a just God. They're going to be lost, but God knows how to meet out, you know, he knows how to meet out the justice. And the reason why I know they're going to be lost, if they hadn't obeyed the truth, if the Bible is true, if the Bible is true and uh, uh, the truth is what saves, well, individuals who have not obeyed the truth, the logical conclusion is what? They have to be lost, right? I was thinking some people uh, got to miss the demeanor of the word. They won't ask questions, and they just follow instead of asking questions. When well, I was just thinking if they were taught wrong and they thought that they were being taught right, what happened to them? And that, that's my question. That's right. My well, I would say I would say that you know there are a lot of individuals that don't want to ask questions. They don't want to rock the boat. But it really. I mean, isn't it a personal responsibility for individuals to question why they are doing what they're doing? I mean, if you really love God, don't you seek first the kingdom and his righteousness? Matthew 6.33? Sure, uh, I would say I'm the type of person that would. I was just... Right. I was trying to get it for some people that don't ask questions. Maybe they might not understand. Well, you know, a lot of times it's the case, too, that you may not ask a question or this person may not ask a question, but... Uh, if you hear other people asking the question, maybe you'll hear the answer to a question that you were afraid to ask. See, there, 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 there's a, a great benefit to having dialogue like we're having. We have people call in all the time asking questions, and later on you hear someone say, you know what, that person asked a question that I always wanted to know, but I didn't want to ask it. Well, you should have asked it. You know, but since you didn't, at least you got to hear the answer. I say like the people in like the Baptist church that are being taught that they don't have to be baptized and things of that nature that if the people believe what their pastor's saying, I mean, being ignorant of the Bible, I, I, was, I guess is what I'm saying. I, well, there's, I mean, I mean, ignorance is not going to be an excuse. But th that's really why we're trying, we're so determined to get the truth out for people to hear it. You know, because we want, th we want to put in their minds this idea that, you know what, your pastor's not telling you the truth. Well, that's and, a fact. You know, and pretty soon, you know, pretty soon you get the truth out enough, the, the people will start rebelling against the, you know, against the ones who are actually teaching them uh, the false doctrine. You know, they'll, they'll get enough truth in them that they'll start questioning, you know, what they're being, te being taught. And that's, you know, that's all that we can do. But, uh, and the bottom line the individuals are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I can't say that someone's going to get a pass just because they didn't want to ask a question. Right. Well, I thank you. So. Have a great night. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, uh, you know, the idea that uh, that you're that you're uh, uh, going to get a pass, perhaps because you didn't you didn't question. Well, you know, you're in the hands of a just God, and. Uh, uh, God knows how to deal out that punishment. There's um, in, in Luke 12, 48, they that know uh, know to do the Lord's will, they're going to be punished. They know it and didn't do it. And those that didn't know it will be punished with few stripes. So uh, ignorance is no excuse. We're trying to, and we're trying to get people to see that you've got, you got to start examining. Acts 17, 11, they didn't even give an apostle a pass. You know, they searched the scriptures daily. So uh, anyway, Listen to what this gentleman says about asking questions. Sure. If there's anything you want to ask me, if I can answer it, I will. And you said right. you're the deacon, right? I'm one of the deacons. One. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Now, he, he, he said, anything you want to ask me, you can. You know, that's fine. He'll try to give an answer. Now, later he, 
deferred us to his pastor. And isn't that really the way it should be? You know, dear friends out here in the Baptist church, Methodist church, Lutheran church, whatever it may be, if you are watching this program and you want to question us or you don't know how to answer what we're saying because your doctrine uh, is, uh, is not, ha you haven't been taught uh, your doctrine, why don't you defer us to your pastor? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get you to realize, friends, that we can answer not only the doctrine, but we can answer your pastor who teaches the doctrine. And probably more than likely, we know the doctrine better than the pastor does. We study, we study the denominational doctrines just so we'll know what you believe and can help you see this is what you believe, even though you may not even know that you believe it because of that. See, I was talking to a young man the other day, and I said, well, I've got the Baptist manual. And he looked at me like, what are you talking about? Yeah, you've got a Baptist manual. There's a Baptist faith and message, the ba Hiscox Baptist manual. All of these are, are creeds and they're guidelines that you use that the pastor won't tell you about, but that's what he uses. See, we're trying to get you to question. Now, this man went on to say uh, that actually we... Uh, 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 that they were that they would be willing to meet and discuss the Bible. Let's see if I can find that. It'll be for let me see here. I'm looking at three minutes. No, closer to four. Apologize. Don't have this divided up for you. But here we go. And we'll give you why we believe what we what we believe from the Bible. And we're saying let let the community get both sides of it. You know? oh, well, I, Would that I be something it, you'd be interested in, or maybe uh, I, I don't know, but I'll, 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 I'll talk to my. Let me see. Believe this, or why you teach this, and we'll give you. The Bible says, give an answer for why you believe what you believe. Oh, hallelujah! First, first, first Peter three fifteen. Without, an a, without a shadow of a doubt. And so we ask, we ask, uh, you know, local preachers, pastors, whoever, you know, reverends, whatever they want to call themselves, to come on TV and I say, you know, listen, you know, why do you, why do you believe this, and why do you teach this, and we'll give you why we believe what we what we believe from the Bible. And we're saying let, let the community get both sides of it, you know? Oh, oh, I, Would that I be something that. you'd be interested in or maybe... Uh, I, I don't know, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk to my pastor, and I'll refer you to, to, you to my pastor. Okay. You see what I'm saying? And, boy, he's a willing man okay. to, to, reach, uh, to reach people, you see. As a matter of fact, on Sunday mornings at 8 o'clock on WDVA, he is a ministry on WDVA. Tune in on Sunday mornings. WDVA. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay, now, he's a willing man to, to help people. He's a willing man, so he sounded like a good idea. We hope this gentleman will come out to the tent and bring his pastor. I don't think he will when we invited him. When he invited him, he said, well, he's going to be going out of town. Now, we're hoping that he's not out of town just yet. I think he said he's going to go out of town Sunday. So you got one more night out there. Uh, uh, pastor, I believe it's Clarence Harrison over at the Bennett Memorial Missionary Baptist Church, and uh, that's over on uh, uh, Chatelain, Chatelain uh, Avenue. Maybe it's uh, Levelton Avenue, somewhere down right, right down there by the college, on uh, on uh, uh, 86. Come on out. We're we're waiting for you. We're looking for you. We hope that you will come and bring several others. As a matter of fact, uh, this is what. Uh, uh, this is what he says about the in invite. Let's see, 6.30. No, nope, too much. Coming on back. Trying to find this on the cuff here. Pastor, out to the tent, and because we, we have a question. Hey, but a little scribbling then. But I'm saying that to say, God knew that we would be right here having this conversation about his goodness right now. I don't know how he knew that. God knew that. Well, what we'd like to do then is just, because I know you, you've, you've got things you need to do and, and uh, we're trying to cover some more ground, but we'd like for you or, or you bring your pastor out to the tent and because we, we have a question every night. You know, we have a microphone, people ask questions. And, uh, <laughs> you know, let's just have some dialogue. I got your track in my car. Okay. I'm going to give it to my pastor. Okay. Now, he's going out of town this weekend, okay. uh, Sunday the for next weekend to the third. Mm -hmm. so you can but I'll give him the track, and he and I and 
we might bring we might bring more more of one or two. Bring them on. Bring See what I'm saying? Because one one thing about it is, we don't know everything about the Word of God. You know, if we know everything about the Word of God. We'd be we'd be just like God. Right. We'd know everything. <laughs> we wouldn't you see have to study or anything. But nobody knows everything about the Word of God but God. That's right. That's you see what I'm saying? But it's so, our job to get out get out what He put in it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Now, now, yeah, we don't know everything about the Word of God, but on this, friends, there's some things that are easier to find out than others. And see, the one question we're trying to ask: Well, let's find out where God put the Missionary Baptist Church. See, let's let's find where that is in the Bible, and if it's not in there, let's let's don't. Let's don't go there. Let's get out of the Missionary Baptist Church. And see, that's the kind of dialogue we're having. He lost a question. He didn't mind questioning. He didn't mind being asked a question. And he didn't mind asking some questions. Now, there's one thing that I want to, another thing I want to play about this man said that I will say a hearty amen to. And this is kind of along the points of what we're saying about the, the uh, prophetesses and the uh, 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 apostles and so forth. Listen to what he said about people who say things. These people, he says, are going to say things that, you know, anybody can say something. Here's what he says. Since I have been to attend revival, didn't I? To that, that we belong to God. That's right. That's you right. You see what I'm saying? We can't have yeah. a... People we can't can say have anything. A, That's right. We can't have a differential in that. That's right. You see, all of us collectively belong to God. Mm -hmm. well, and we're saying that if, if we all belong to God, to. We, ought to be, we ought to be unified. Well, you know, speaking the same thing. But if we, we say so, same, but I know we don't speak the same. Thing. If we say so that we belong to God, then we got to com compare men to that that we belong to God. That's right. That's you right. See, if we all belong to God, to. we ought to be we ought to be unified. Well, you know, speaking the same thing. But if I know we, we say so, same, but I know we don't speak the same. Thing. If we say so that we belong to God, then we got to com compare men to that that we belong to God. That's right. That's you right. You see what I'm saying? We can't have yeah. a. People we can't can say have anything. A, that's right. We can't have a differential in that. That's right. You see what I'm saying? Because the only thing that's going to matter is what the Word of God says. That's okay. Now, see, I can agree with that. If you're going to say you belong to God, then you're going to have to demonstrate it by some way, shape, or form, by, by the way you live, what you, you know, the, what you say, what you do. Now, if you say you belong to God, then let's, let's just prove it. Let's just prove it. Now, I, I want you to know, friends, that I can appreciate this, but... There's nothing wrong with asking questions. That's what we're trying to get you to do. We're trying to get you to come out to the tent, come out to the uh, assemblies of the Church of Christ, and let's just ask a question. Let's have some dialogue. Come out. If you don't want to, if you don't want to come out during the, the meeting itself, then, then come out beforehand. You know what? We're, we're not a, afraid or we don't have a problem with individuals uh, coming out and questioning us. So, let's, so let's, let's come out and ask some dialogue. Let's look at the credentials. I mean, if the man says that he's a doctor of the law, there's nothing wrong with asking, questioning that. Would you, would you question whether a man uh, was a legitimate physician if you went to him and you had some suspicion? Now, let me see, let me see your credentials. Would you have a problem with that? Would you, would, would you question then if a man says, well, I'm reverend so-and-so? I'm going to question it because my Bible says that reverend is a name that belongs only to God. And I'm going to question anybody that says that they are reverend. I'm going to question anybody that says they are an apostle. I'm going to question anybody that says they're a prophet. Why? Because I am not going to accept at face value just what they say. I'm going to try those spirits. I'm going to examine it. And so that's what we're trying to get you to do. Now, we're, we're busting myths because we're showing, friends, that the preachers are scared. The myth is that preachers from the church of... Church of men are not afraid of the Church of Christ. They're not afraid of what we teach. They're not afraid of what we preach. <clears throat> They're not afraid to answer us. That's what that's what the, the word on the street is. Listen. What's the Bible say? Hello. Hello. I said you seem to be challenging all of the preachers that they are afraid to call in. Yes, sir. But that is not the case. Are you a preacher? Yes, I am. Well, I am so glad to hear from one. What do you have to say? But, well, what I want to say to you is that the preachers are not afraid of you. 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 All right, the preachers are not afraid of you. Now, that's what, that's what uh, uh, Apostle Adam said a number of years ago. Now, I know he's no longer with us. He's not among the living. But there are a number of individuals that call themselves apostles 
that do seem to be afraid of us. They're, they're, they're afraid of us. You know, here's an example of what we're talking about. You know, the other night, or the other day when, uh, see if I can find this, the other day when uh, Micah went in to talk to Mr. Ronnie Andrews, I know y'all have seen the commercial. Can, can we just run that commercial one more time, Charles? Can we just queue it up and run the commercial? Uh, this, this man, this is the comment that was made about this commercial after this lady saw it. What if I say I won't give you a knuckle? A knuckle sandwich. Times are hard, and pastors are getting angry and damble. Whether you believe the way I believe or not, I don't care. Videotape me. I run the devil out of our church, so get out. Don't come on this property again. Understand me. All right, well, as I leave, right. as I, leave I hope you read 2 Timothy 2. I hope you read too, son. You worry about your own problems and get out of our business. There is no better business bureau in religion. The Church of Christ, then, is your best bet. We're at the tent, 7 p.m. each night, June 22nd through July the 3rd, across from the mall in Danville on Mount Cross, right next to Leggett's Town and Country. Now, when, when, when the lady that Micah was talking to uh, heard about this, when she, when she realized what was going on, excuse me, this is what she said. No, uh, I'm not... I ain't never heard it. That man must have been scared to death of you. Oh, he must have. I mean, that's what I'm thinking. You know, just... He just, had to have been. Yeah. Can't stand, stand up for what he's saying. There there had to be a fear in him for something. Um, I can't say what it was. I don't have no idea, but... Uh, I, I've never been in a church that I would know of anybody that actually would run people out. I've heard that man must have been scared to death of you. That man must have been scared to death of you. That man must have been scared to death of you. Now, you see, friends, I know the community can see that individuals who don't give an answer for why they believe what they believe, they've got to be scared. They are scared of the truth. They're scared that their doctrine can't stand up to it. Now, why would you then want to be in a church where the man was actually afraid to defend what he tells you on Sunday. You know, I'd be, I'd be leaving in droves. And I think that's why there's a lot of people out there who, who just sit, sit back and say, I'm tired of church. Because these guys are just a bunch of quacks. They're just a bunch of individuals that are out looking for, for money. They're looking for a, a nest of feather. They're not interested in my soul. They're only interested in what they can get out of it. And these guys are scared. How do we know we're scared? The other day, and I... I, I looked for the, the video clip. Uh, I don't have it on my computer. But the other day, down at Eden Baptist Church, right down from where we meet, we meet at 250 the Boulevard in Eden, and right down the road from where we met, uh, one of our brethren and I, we went in. We went and, and uh, in because we were invited by one of the members. One of the members asked us. We were knocking doors. We, what the member uh, said when she saw who we were, we said we want to invite you to come to our services and examine what we're teaching. You're welcome to ask questions. Come and join us. She said, well, why don't you come over to my church? And I said, where is it? She said, the Eden Baptist Church. And I said, okay. Well, we went down to the Eden Baptist Church. So on Wednesday night, we walk in the door. Mr. Darrell Law, who is the pastor of the Eden Baptist Church, when he saw us, you could tell his face dropped. He went over and started whispering to one of his members. And he comes back, makes his way back. Now, all the members were friendly to us. But he makes his way on back, and we said, well, we understood. Told the lady's name. We could be here and ask questions. Do you have Bible study tonight? He said, no, not tonight. We're just having prayer and singing. And I said, well, what about next week? Do you have prayer and singing on, uh, or do you have a Bible study on Wednesday night? He said, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. It just depends. Now, I wondered what it depended on. I think it depends on whether we show up or not. Now, why is it that individuals will be afraid to have someone ask a question? As a matter of fact, Mr. Ronnie Andrews, if you, were, if you recall, actually told Micah and, uh, and Mark, I believe, that they could come and ask questions. And let me see if I can find that. Come back and ask questions. I know I've seen that somewhere. Uh, come ask questions. Come back Sunday. Here it is. Okay. So I'm not allowed to ask questions. No, sir. Not allowed to ask questions. I'm just trying to ask questions. You come to Sunday school. I'm That's what trying questions. To Sunday school. I'm That's just what trying questions. To understand. You come to Sunday school. I'm That's just what trying questions. To understand.
If you want to ask questions, you come to Sunday school. So they went. They went and asked questions. They went to Sunday school and asked questions. And that's when they got to, you get out of my business. Now, friends, I just can't believe that you're going to sit there and say, well, that was the right thing to do. That that man acted as a, as a so-called Christian, as a true believer, that he acted in a, in a manner that was a giving a defense of the gospel. So we're, we're showing you, we're busting the myth that preachers in the church of men are not afraid of the church of Christ. I say they're scared to death of us. They're scared to death of us. When I went to ask the, when I went to ask Mr. Uh, Ronnie <clears throat> a question about uh, uh, the way his behavior, and uh, Brandon, I don't think I have this on my computer even. I know I have it. It's not labeled. But I wanted to show how, here it is. This is how the secretary reacted to us. We went simply to ask a question. Uh, uh, in fact, if he says something about it, rem remind him that he said videotape him last time Mike was here. Here we are. Ring the bell. Now watch what the secretary does. Come. Mr. Andrews here? Locks the door. I'm sorry? Okay. Do you know when you expect him? Sometimes afternoon. Okay. Thank you. Now, 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 friends, what is it that's so scary about me? Now, I, I, I know I, I maybe look scary. You know, I mean, I'm a little scary compared to a little child or something, but am I that bad? But here we are. Coming up here just to get another statement about why Mr. Ronnie Andrews acted the way he did. And the first thing that happens is the secretary locks the door. You know, we're closed for business. Now, if I'd known the door was open, I'd have gone on in. See? But why is it that people are afraid? I think he was there. Two cars in the parking lot. I think he was there, and I think he's hiding behind the secretary. I think he's hiding behind the woman's dress. Why? Because they're scared. So don't tell me that these guys aren't scared. They're scared to death. They're shivering in their boots about the Church of Christ coming to town. Right after that, not 10 minutes later, you know what happens? The police show up down the tent and say, y'all need to stay off the property. All we did was go ask a question. Ask a question like he said we could, like, like uh, he was told that he would give the first time. Yeah, they're scared. They're afraid. They're running. They run and hide. We had a, there was a gentleman up in uh, uh, Martinsville. Jim up in Martinsville that when we came on the TV set after him, you know what was said? He would he would hide in the kitchen. He would hide in the kitchen when we came on the set until we left because he didn't want a confrontation. Now, uh, if, if that's not afraid, I don't know what is. Here's a, uh, here's a statement that was actually made about him. Let's see here. Albert. Albert runs and hides. I apologize for not having all these in here. Uh, Albert hides is what I'm looking for. I actually have uh, Charles saying it. Do a search on Albert there. Can you find that for me? I don't know what to do. Here, let's just play this. Uh oh. How come I can't find it? Oh. Here. We'll just do this. This is that. that they, they feel like y'all are. Just chase preachers down and, and, and try to embarrass them and try and try to to um, make them look bad. Uh, poor Albert Robertson, he 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 looks at his videos as he can on Sunday, just to avoid you know having a conversation. I think. 
I want to go home. I pour Albert Robertson. He, he, he zips out his dress, puts his can on Sunday, just to avoid, you know, having a conversation, I think. <laughs> now, this is what we're talking about, friends. These guys are running and hiding. Uh, the, I believe it was the, the, the chief apostle over here uh, ran and hid, wouldn't talk to Johnny. Uh, the man up in heaven with the name here, Brandon, uh, the man that drives the Bentley. I mean in Martinsville, the guy in Martinsville that, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Campbell. Yeah, Campbell's in Danville. Who's the one who uh, uh, was in Martinsville that uh, threatened, yeah, with, that threatened with the gun? There, there's so many of them that are scared. Kill them, all right. The, you know, threatening, threatening with the gun, threatening to sue. They all threaten to sue. Uh, I say just, you know, sue. You can't get blood out of a turnip. You know, they assault. Actually had, a, had a, a gentleman take the cameraman by the arm and escort him out very gruffly and told him not to come back. That was down here at the Cathedral of His Glory, one of the biggest churches in, in Greensboro, I suppose. And we've got, we've got footage of all this. They steal the, they steal the uh, film from the 15-year-old boy, won't get it back. Now, if they're not afraid, why is all this happening? They, come on and, they may come on and debate, but they don't finish it. They say they'll come back, they won't finish it. Jerry Carter, Dr. Jerry Carter, from the Reedsville Baptist Church, down in Reedsville, biggest Baptist church in Reedsville, said he'd come back, won't come back. He won't come back on, right here on this set. Invited him to come back, said he'd come back, wouldn't do it. Uh, we've already showed you Marty Roberts. Marty Roberts said he'd come back, defend one in the Godhead. He moved out of town. You know, I don't know where he is. So uh, why is it that, uh, that they won't do this? I say it's because they're scared. And I think we're giving you ample proof to show that they're afraid of the truth. They're afraid of what we're doing. They're afraid of, of their doctrine. And that's what the community actually says. I already played you that. And... Uh, and I actually played you uh, uh, Stacy at the tent who says they're scared, they're afraid. Now, is that, not, is that not a myth that is easily busted? These guys are afraid to death. These are afraid of death. Now, what about this? What about the statement that preachers of the churches of men will defend what they teach? Now, the reason I call it churches of men, folks, is because I'm getting tired of saying denominations. Denomination means part of a whole. These are churches of men. They ain't got nothing to do with the church of, church of Christ. They're nothing from God. They're churches of men as opposed to the churches of Christ. There are churches that belong to men as opposed to churches that belong to our Lord and Savior. Now, when people tell me, well, my preacher will defend what they teach. Oh, really? Well, why is it that they're not showing up? Why is it that they're not giving a defense? Why is it that they will uh, rather uh, hide instead of give, instead of give the defense that they, that they claim to do? I don't know about you, friends, but I would definitely say, I would definitely say that that myth is busted. They will not give a defense. As a matter of fact, here is what uh, Randy Linderman said, a preacher, Baptist preacher, said as we were uh, in a discussion, in a discussion of, about uh, salvation, or about the Baptist church, actually. But this is what he said about uh, getting out of the debate. Listen to what he says. If we're getting to our next question here on 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 salvation, but the thing is, but you we'll know, refrain from a, a portion of okay. that. I know, but I thought it was a good time just to bring okay. up that. that all right. Well, let, let me. Let me. I'm looking forward to the hell. Right. So let, yeah, but let Amen. me. So let me just answer this. Romans 10. 9 Wish 10, I'd bring right this debate. Romans 10. <laughs> He said, he said he wishes you could go to heaven right now to get out of this debate. I'm looking forward to going to heaven. Romans 10, 9 to 10. 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 Romans 10, 9 to came uh, to my mind, it might be another reason why he is afraid. I believe it's in Acts 19 where there were craftsmen who were afraid that their business was going to be lost. And he did say, stay out of my business. That's exactly right. My property. So 
you know, it's his business. It, it's not really, you know, like a house of worship, maybe. I, it's more of his business, at least in that statement. Right. And it certainly is a business for him. You know, they run it like a business. As a matter of fact, uh, let me see if I, I could uh, show you an excerpt. I'd have to find it, but I'd, I could show you. Brandon, can you come find this for me? Uh, it is a uh, article. It's from. The, it's a statement from the. Uh, look for. Uh, just type in pastor. I think we'll find it in in looking uh, regular file here. But actually, is an excerpt from the Hiscox Baptist Manual that says that the pastor runs everything. Now he's in charge of everything. Now if that doesn't coincide or dovetail very nicely with it being a business, I don't know what does. Let's see here. Well, uh, he, he said it was his business. These are tough economic times, so he might be fearing that, you know, his livelihood. Well, I, I think you're right. I think you're right. Let's just see here. I think I can, I'm going to have to open another. It's a whole file. So, uh, but let's see this. Uh, here we go. Nope, not what I wanted. Not what I wanted. Sorry about that. And I apologize. All this is just kind of coming off the cuff. Brainstorming, as it were. Uh, well, did you? It was. Uh, we we actually played it in the. Uh, we used it in our our lesson the other night. And that's what I'm going to find. Look for tent. Danville tent. Well, uh, I'm going to uh, let another caller call, and I don't believe your numbers are up on the screen. Oh yeah, put your numbers up, please. That may be why we're not getting any phone calls coming in. No one can can hear. Look right here. This is from the this is from the Hiscox Baptist Manual. Hiscox Baptist Manual. Here we go. And this is what it says about the pastor. The pastor has the oversight and supervision of all interests of the church and of all departments of its work, both spiritual and temporal. He should not needlessly interfere with the deacons or trustees or Christian education workers, nor assume dictatorial, dictatorial uh, authority over others, yet it is his privilege and duty to hold a watch of supervision over all the work of the church. Well, we're talking about one-man rule. We're talking about the pastor being in charge of everything concerning the Baptist church. The pastor should be concerned for the uh, should be concerned for the religious nurture of children and youth, but not to the neglect of others. And then the last statement here is he is equally the shepherd of of all his flock. And you know that's really what we're getting down to when we're talking about these pastors having this uh, uh, fear of losing something. You know that's why the Jews killed Jesus is because they were going to lose they were going to lose their hold of what they uh, what they had. You're on the air. Hey, how you doing, James? I'm doing fine. Um, you, I just got in a little while ago and I was uh, tried to call you and couldn't get you and Revelation 2 1 is what you was quoting a while ago. 2-2, two, two. yes sir. 2-2. Two, two. Good, um, uh, was that the intent of that passage? Uh, what, what do you mean, what was the intent of it? To prove what that they were the trying to possibly find them liars? Uh, I lost you the, there, James. The, the, intent, the intent of the passage was Jesus was telling them, I know your works, I know the good things you have done, mm -hmm. but I have something against you. Verse 4. And my point is Jesus was commending them for doing these things these things, he approved of these things, and one of the things that he approved of was trying people who say they were apostles and finding them liars. Okay. I don't have no trouble, you know, with just about, most, probably 99% of what you, what y'all say, because I have been to your tent. You know who this right, is. Right, right. I know who you are. Uh, for some reason I'm fading out. <laughs> Hold on just a minute. Let me change phones. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the thing that Christ was doing here was actually commending some good things they had done, but yet they had, uh, you know, they had stopped doing them, have somewhat against thee. You've left your first love. Okay, because, you know, after I started reading it, because I always check behind y'all when you, you know, you're quoting the scriptures, and that one there I went on down farther and was reading. Right. And from what I got from the intent of it, 
uh, he agreed with them for judging, but he was also against the ones where it was judging because they left their first love. Is right. that correct? Right. Okay. I just want to make sure because that was, that was the intent I got out of it. Because right. we, we do judge. Right. That's exactly right. For righteous judgment. But right. the intent of that whole thing was they had left their first love. Right. Right. Okay. I just wanted to just okay. make sure we agreed on it. All right. All right. Thank you. That, that's fine. Thanks for your call. Oh, yeah. That's right. You know, so you, you have to realize, you know, their first love. Now, b by the way, friends, you can talk, you can find their first love. If you look in, Act, in, in Acts 19, you'll find the church at Ephesus. They were so zealous for the truth in Acts 19, they were burning their books. And now, here they are writing, and, and Christ says, you left your first love. You've done all this great stuff, and now you've kind of let it go by the wayside. You're, you're on the air. You're on the air. Yes, sir. Uh, Larry Smith calling. And, oh. uh, I, I got this book here, and I thought maybe it might be a benefit. And I appreciate what you're doing and respect uh, the way you interpret the Bible and everything. Uh, but I got a book here that's called The Battle for Baptist Integrity, uh, written by Russell Dilday or John F. Ba and John F. Ball. Is that familiar to you? Uh, vaguely, not not really, but I'm um, assuming okay. like it sounds well, better Okay, if I read you a little bit of it, well, what you, I think can, it applies to exactly what you're saying. Okay, all right. <laughs> it says, uh, fundamentalist preachers perceive themselves to be chief executive officers of Baptist congregations, church committees, or a nuisance to the career of a fundamentalist preacher. If a NAS committee not controlled by the preacher is anathema to him. Okay. You know what it sounds to me like? sounds to me like what we should have done is put all the Baptist preachers in charge of the auto, auto business. <laughs> Just, I mean, <laughs> what I'm saying is making no, is that, that positive sound, what I'm saying that sound, or, or that I don't sound, know what I'm talking about. Sounds about right. They're chi the chief executive officers. Yeah, I'm, I'm reading this right out of this Bible. Right. Out of this book, and it says, in that an exciting church gradually yields great power to a fundamentalist preacher. Money is a necessity. It brings outstanding entertainers and public figures <laughs> to speak to the congregation. I don't. I don't think they're meaning that for good, though. But that's exactly. That's exactly right. You're exactly right. I'd like to get a copy of that book. Uh, 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 Larry, it's Larry, right? Yes, sir. Uh, didn't you call I last night? I called you last night. That's right. And uh, I don't want to run. I told you I had uh, bladder cancer. Right. And I uh, went to the doctor today. But uh, I've been, you know, I, once in a while I pick up a book like this but I, and read it. But you know, it says, The Battle for Baptist Integrity. Everyone interested in the future of the Baptist denomination and our nation should read well, this book. I'm, I'm a, I am might pick that up just to find out what the Baptists are thinking. But. You know, really, the 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 book I'll to read to you, for sir. the book to read for integrity is the Bible. Wouldn't you agree, sir? The 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 book to read for the battle of integrity is the Bible. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, sir. That's You're right. right about that. That's because right. Because anybody can write a book, but I think what this guy, the, uh, what he's writing about is uh is uh you know uh, things in the in the Baptist church. Right. Probably other well, churches. Well, Larry, listen, I'm gonna try to get another phone call before before we go. Okay, sir. But but I appreciate you. Uh, good to talk your, to I've you. I've been watching your program every night. I'm gonna try to get out to your tent. <laughs> okay. Now remember, if you need a ride, didn't we get some information from you? Yes, sir. If if you need a ride, we'll get you one. Uh, okay. Yeah, I I, I really enjoy uh, what you say. Your your the way you interpret the Bible and everything and. Uh, I really enjoy it. All right. Well, well thank you. Keep God watching. Bless you. All right. Have a good night. You on the air? Yes, Brother James. How you doing, sir? Hey, I'm doing well. Good. Um, I'm a pastor out of town, and what? I heard uh, about you from through some other pastors. Okay. I don't really, I don't really understand what it's all about. So really, I'm calling in. What is can you turn your? Are you on? Are you watching the online? Yes, I am. Can you, can I, you, on television. Turn, turn, turn your volume down a little bit, please. Okay. okay. Sounds better. L yes, sir. What 
what is the what is what is what is y'all all about? I know you're about Christ, but when you go to the tents or go to the churches, what is what are you what are you trying to what's your point? What are you trying to see if the pastor is not real or we're just trying to see if they will defend what they teach like the Bible says you should do. First Peter three fifteen, be ready always to give an answer. Okay. To every man to ask you the reason the hope that's in you with meekness and fear, and these guys won't give an answer. You know, they're afraid of questions. You know, they're afraid okay. of being examined. But, you know, in Acts, Acts 17, 11, these people actually tested, you know, they actually tested a, uh, a, an apostle. So I don't see where that's, you know, a bad thing to, to scrutinize or examine someone. Yes. But they, you know, we actually get, uh, you know, I guess they're basically treated like, you know, second-rate, second-class citizens, or criminals, because we're just simply asking a question. Now, Brother James, let me ask you a quick question. I know there's others behind me. I don't, I don't find what you're doing personally wrong. Okay. And when, I, when I do say this, if we all say that we believe in Christ, especially if we're leaders, if we feel like we don't know something, we need to go learn it then. All right. Okay? I don't have a problem with that. Um, and I, I feel that a lot of times what leaders um, do sometimes, I believe that we are caught up so much in the materialistic thing of church and the body of Christ, I believe the substance of who God is in our lives spiritually and personally, we forgot about that. We're busy doing fundraisers and we're running after, and we know it takes money to do ministry and to pay bills, but I believe the body of Christ has been consumed with materialism. I, I agree with that. And you know what? This, this is what I would say, and I'm, I'm going to have to wrap up here. i got about two minutes. But 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 here's the thing. Here's what I would say: If people would get back to what the Bible says, do yes. everything the Bible the Bible way, uh, the Bible's way, then you wouldn't have to worry about paying the bills or taking care of ministry because God has put in place a way to furnish those funds. That is, on the first day of the week, let everyone lay by him in store as God has prospered him. First Corinthians sixteen one and two. Now you know if you do it that way, and the brethren re realize this is you know, God's way, they're not going to have to go out and have bake sales and yard sales and, and uh, you know, car washes and things like this. They'll just, they'll give on the first day of the week and it'll be taken care of. That's how these TV programs are put on. It's by Christians giving on the first day of the week, laying by in store and determining this is the work that we're going to do and this is how we're going to spread the gospel and it all comes from, from that free will offering upon the first day of the week. I like that. But before you before you go, you said you're from out of town. Will you tell us who you are and where you are and where you're from? I am Pastor Maurice. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I'm in this area doing a um, seminar or a revival, I should say, slash seminar. And um, so I'm in this area. I'm, I'm so this is the first time I heard about you. Right. Some things in the air. I don't didn't really. You went under a tent for another gentleman that I knew of. Um, but um, I really didn't know much about you, so I'm sitting here looking at you on television, so I said, let me call in. Right. Just ask, you know, what you're all about and things of that nature. I know where, you believe you, in Christ. I, I only got a few seconds. Where, where's your seminar? I'll be in the, I'll be in the, I'm still learning this area, and I have the, one of the adjectives with me that knows this area. I'll be in the Danville area at um, Memorial uh, Pentecostal Church, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, I'm not sure where that is, but we, we can find it. We might meet you. We might come by and meet you. Would well, by good? all means, come on by, Brother okay. James. Okay, Memorial, I Memorial by. Pentecostal Church in Danville. Yes, sir. It's, it's called Memorial Pentecostal Church in Danville. Okay, all right, I got to go. I got to go. Okay, thank thanks you. For, thanks for your call. want to uh -huh. remind people to come to the tent. We are 335 Mount Cross Road, and bring your pastor for a $50, gift, for a $50 gas card. We'll be glad to we'll be glad to see you there, and uh, it goes through July third. So come on out and be with us. Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting babble? If you want to find people who are studying God's Word, come examine the Church of Christ. We're meeting right here at 250 the Boulevard in downtown Eden. If you want to hear more plain Bible teaching. Watch A Word from the Lord, Thursday nights at 9 o'clock, right here on WGSR.
You're watching the Carolina Virginia Superstation, WGSR 47.1 Digital. Rest in the 2008 stabbing death of a Danville woman, and sadly, the victim's own son is charged with a murder. Today, the Danville Police Department arrested 18 year old Travis Coleman Lewis of Danville. He's been charged with the first degree murder of his mother, 40 year old Brenda Marie Lewis. It was a story that scared many of the residents of the Holland Road section of Danville, many of them calling Star News to say that they were scared at the time that a killer was on the loose. As you may recall, Star News gave extensive coverage to this story. It was in the early morning hours of August the 15th of 2008. That's when Danville police officers responded to the 700 block of Holland Road because of a double stabbing. Police found Brenda Marie Lewis dead in the front yard of the residence. She was killed by multiple stab wounds. Lewis's son, Travis Lewis, who was 17 at the time, was also on the scene. He had stab wounds, but the Danville Police Department reported that they were non-life threatening. Travis Lewis was treated for his wounds at the Danville Regional Medical Center. Brenda Lewis's body was sent to the office of the chief medical examiner. There's no word yet on what led police to charge Travis Lewis with the murder of his own mother. No motive given at this time. But again, the big news out of Danville today, 18-year-old Travis Coleman Lewis charged with the first degree murder of his own mother, 40-year-old Brenda Marie Lewis on Holland Road. Now we go to Martinsville, Virginia. Star News own Bob Sharp is standing by with news that a retired Virginia State Trooper killed this afternoon in a motor vehicle accident. He was riding his motorcycle when apparently a vehicle pulled out in front of him. Bob, let's uh, talk about this case. Uh, and uh, I'm going to ask my uh, producers to change the graphic, please. Uh, Bob, let's talk about this. What uh, happened in this case? Uh, it was just a, a, a mere accident where a young man pulled out in front of uh, the trooper, and, uh, and he was on his motorcycle and uh, just actually ran into the side of it. And uh, as a result, it threw him off the motorcycle about 20 feet. And, of course, he suffered... Uh, multiple uh, injuries and en uh, route to the Baptist Hospital, he, he died uh, on the way. Bob, let's uh, mention this uh, trooper had not been retired, uh, had been retired uh, a very short time. He had served with the Virginia State Police for for quite a long time. Uh, his name was Ralph Carroll, is that right? I, I understand, is he assigned to Henry County? That's correct. He, he's well known in the area. Um, We've been told he was retired, but then I've, you know, I've just recently I've run into him and he was working. We think maybe that he was just in the process of retiring. I've talked with someone since then that said that he was supposed to retire in November, but he was in the uh, process of retiring, we understand, and a uh, very tragic uh, accident, very uh, tragic incident. And in fact, uh, law enforcement personnel from the state police, also um, Bob Bush from the Henry County Sheriff's Department is on the scene as we speak now still doing the reconstruction of uh, exactly what happened. Here's video from the scene of that accident that killed uh, Ralph Carroll, who was a trooper with the Virginia State Police. Uh, Bob, uh, this is one of those accidents that happens quite frequently in the summertime. Uh, some people just, it appears, they just don't see people on motorcycles, and, and these, these accidents happen, and unfortunately, a lot of them end up with fatalities. It is. It's very sad, but you're right. Uh, of course, the law they changed uh, a while back at requiring uh, to have your uh, headlights on, and that was for that reason, so that people could readily see them. People just don't see them, and these sort of things happen, and it's uh, just a very tragic story. It was a 19-year-old man that uh, uh, certainly will be uh, it's being investigated. We've talked to sources that say he may be charged with either reckless driving or failing to yield right away, but certainly not manslaughter. Bob, what's what's uh, the 19-year-old's name? Do we have we have his name right? Yes, it's uh, Chris Cunningham. And uh, he lives there in Henry County. That's correct. Okay. And uh, so, Bob, uh, how long how long do you think they're going to be on the scene? You you told me just a few moments ago the Commonwealth's attorney was there on the scene as well as law enforcement uh, reconstruction specialists. And so, how long do you think they're going to be on the scene there? Uh, I'd say probably another 30 minutes or so. They're uh, calling in the wreckers and uh, moving, removing the vehicles, but they are really concentrating on exactly what happened and, and doing this in detail. We'll have more follow-up on that as it, as it happens. All right, Bob. And what's the mood with uh, the Virginia State Troopers uh, that maybe had to go respond uh, to this with whether one of their fellow officers uh, 
dying uh, because of this accident. What's what's the move? It's disbelief. Uh, we saw quite a few of the Henry County uh, police officers. They came out and they certainly helped in the traffic, but uh, people just, uh, law enforcement just kind of really came out in a show of force. Just uh, They were just shocked. Uh, I mean, everybody's known Ralph for years and years. He's just one of the uh, well-respected, uh, noble police officers in Henry County, and it's just, everybody's just kind of in shock. All right. Star News on Bob Sharp reporting from Henry County where a retired Virginia State Trooper uh, died this afternoon after apparently a vehicle uh, pulled out in front of him and he was killed in that accident. Bob, you had another uh, wreck that you covered today as well. Uh, let's talk about that. Uh, not as bad as this one, of course, but still uh, any accident can be bad, but this one was kind of a rear ender as, as I understand. Uh, it did, Mark. That's just a bad intersection. Folks pull out and they're coming over top of the hill, and some people will, you know, have a tendency to speed a little bit. I think this posted speed limit is uh, 45, then it drops to 35. Uh, it's slated for the state to put a stoplight there, but because of the budgetary restraints now, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. But we see quite a few accidents of this this type. Fortunately, we don't think anyone was seriously injured, but uh, the state police are investigating that accident also. And where did this happen, Bob? This was uh, Kings Mountain and Plantation, just above the uh, Sheriff's Department there on Kings Mountain Road. All right. Star News on Bob Sharp reporting from our sister station, Star News Channel, Martinsville, Virginia. Thanks, Bob. We appreciate it. Thank you, Bob. All right. We are waiting on a news conference. Uh, the coroner in Los Angeles.